Hello and welcome to the Attunement Emissary Legacy Series. My name is Gary Goodhue, and I'll be your host. In this episode, we're going to be working with Chapter 2 of Seven Steps to the Temple of Light by Yoranda. Chapter 2 is titled Tranquility. In our last episode, Chapter 1, Patience, we explored divine detachment and this reciprocity of service between the divine aspect of ourselves, the wonderful one within, the God being, and the personality self, the human that we know. In chapter two, Yoranda takes us deeper into tranquility, which is this space of peace and stillness. There are three paragraphs inside of this chapter. So I'm going to read each paragraph and then from there expand a little bit and repeat on some of the parts of the paragraph because it's very, very dense and rich in how much truth that he puts inside of these words. So without further ado, Seven Steps to the Temple of Light, Chapter 2, Tranquility. Tranquility relates to the mental nature of the outer man. In it is the perfect peace of the wonderful one within. In tranquility is the everlasting attitude towards external events, wherein one can truly say, none of these things move me. Tranquility is the supreme virtue of the outer man, for therein is perfect freedom from all external turbulence, perfect freedom in the limitless eternal. In tranquility, all unwanted characteristics are dissolved, for nothing of a destructive nature can abide therein. Tranquility springs forth from the fountain of realization. Let love radiate without thought of results. So Yoranda starts out here by relating the state of tranquility, peace and stillness, to the mental nature of the outer man. And so that is our own attitude, our beliefs, our behavior. This is all the the mental nature of the outer man. And the outer man is the personality self. So when we as the personality self can relate to the world around us in this way of patience that was described in our last episode, in the last chapter, where we're able to see the presence of God within all things and recognize that what's happening around us is only of a temporary manifestation, a part of a creative process, and we're not concerned for the results of what happens, then we can take up this attitude that says, none of these things move me. And how amazing would that be to go through our life in today's world with an attitude of none of these things move me? Because I imagine for most people in the turbulence of today's world, we are moved pretty regularly by things from the outside world all the time. There are so many different pieces of information, news, and knowledge about world events that are disturbing, that can disturb our peace. But this space of tranquility is so powerful because we are sourcing our experience from the absolute reality, the connection within not from what's happening outside of us and around us. And there's a really interesting sentence inside of this first paragraph that I want to read again. In tranquility, all unwanted characteristics are dissolved, for nothing of a destructive nature can abide therein. And if you guys are anything like me, I have battled within myself against my own unwanted characteristics, (laughs) the habits, uh, the, the behaviors, the, the things that I do that I know are destructive, I know they're not any good for me. Some part of me still yet enjoys them, otherwise I wouldn't still entertain these parts of myself. But, but I've fought against them. And what he's saying is that when we go into this space of stillness and are sourcing our experience solely from our inner connection, to the divine presence of the wonderful one within, then we are existing at such a vibratory rate that these lower vibrational parts of self that still operate out of some fear and separation, some destructive nature, they simply cannot exist 
as long as we are holding that space of orientation to the wonderful one within and experiencing the perfect peace that comes with that. And so it's brilliant because there is no need to fight against the self for what isn't working within oneself. In fact, where your attention goes, your energy flows and that thing grows. What you resist persists. So any fighting against is only feeding and strengthening that energy. But if I simply wholeheartedly and fully invest myself in my own inner connection with the divine source of creation, the absolute reality, then those other parts of myself will simply drift away like the illusion that they were born out of. Next paragraph. The outer mind of man is necessary to man's salvation, yet it is the snare that prevents men from entering in. The function of the outer mind is not to attempt to direct the affairs of men, for it is rightly ordained as a channel through which the wonderful one, even the Lord within, may direct all things on the material planes. As an open window for the inner being, the outer mind is perfect. That outer mind which is tranquil and one-pointedly centered in the one within is an open window through which the glories and powers of the Wonderful One may shine forth into the world in perfect service to mankind. Such a mind is an open window through the veil through which man may see and know the wonders of heaven, even the realms of light. This paragraph goes right into the heart of what I think is one of our most challenging aspects of being human and living in this material plane of existence, this dimensional world. Because we have an outer mind and an inner mind. And in some teachings that might be interpreted as the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. But the subconscious mind is so very vast that I think how Yoranda refers to this is that the outer mind is the conscious mind and related to parts of the subconscious that hold patterns that have been programmed in by the conscious mind. But there's also an inner mind, which relates to the, the mind of God, the mind of the wonderful one within, the master self. And this also relates to the subconscious and the entire realms of how we're connected to all that is and the mass consciousness of humanity. So the function of the outer mind is not to attempt to direct the affairs of men. And that is a very challenging thing for us because we are creators and we do have influence in this world of what happens and we hold some responsibility for that. And so we're aware of that and we want to perhaps create greater change and a better way of life for ourselves and the next generation. And so the temptation is to get in there and make it happen based off of our ideas of what would be better. And so we end up manipulating things inside of our outer world in order to create a, a more ideal life experience based out of our image of what we think we would want. But the job of the outer mind, as Yoranda is saying here in this paragraph, it is rightly ordained as a channel through which the Wonderful One, even the Lord within, may direct all things on the material plane. And so we have this widespread human experience of our outer mind being the driver of the car. And not only trying to decide and dictate what should happen and how it should happen, but the actual job of the outer mind is to be in response to the inner mind, the mind of God the connection of the Lord within, the Wonderful One. And so as we kind of get out of the driver's seat and come into a place of uh, followership and listening to the inner voice of the inner mind, of the inner self, and become a servant of that rather than trying to be the master of our own experience, then we're working in right relationship with the divine design of how we were created to be a willing vehicle for divine expression to move through us into this world. And when our mind is doing that, there is tranquility, there's peace, there's stillness. There has to be stillness in order to hear the inner voice of the inner mind, of the inner self. 
And to maintain that space, one must be one-pointedly centered in the one within, giving our full attention, full awareness, completely receptive to that space within, which becomes an open window for the glories and powers of the Wonderful One to shine into the world in perfect service to mankind. And this is another space where, where I think we trip up a lot because we have this personalized ego identity and we want to be known and we want to be seen and respected and loved. And so we try to claim power and glory in relationship to our own life. And that's all the outer mind misfunction because all religions and spiritualities everywhere will have this principle somewhere worked into it where there is a surrender and giving up of the glory and power to that God source and honoring that source which provides the power that can produce miracles inside of our life. And this is the perfect service to man is that divine presence moving through us and directing how we operate in the world. Last paragraph. The way of tranquility is the way of the wonderful one. For he who puts his full and complete trust in the Father within, remaining centered in him, knowing him as the one source, is he who is tranquil. To such a one the tempests and stormy waves of world uncertainty are nothing. For I am that I am, speaks the blessed word, peace, be still. And for him there is a great calm. A tranquil mind lets the sun's light in, and all clouds of darkness are dispelled. He who is patient can be drawn up into tranquility, and therein finds realization. Tranquility flows forth from the one within, calming the waves that distort the vision, removing the mountains that prevent release, pouring the soothing oil of love upon the feverish brow of the weary one who turns wholeheartedly to the Lord. This is the way. No matter how hard anyone may strive, struggle, fight, or attempt to use their outer mind willpower, tranquility is no more than a dream until the weary one turns to the Lord and puts his trust in the wonderful one within. Then it is that he finds peace. Then it is that tranquility unfolds him. Then it is that his outer mind lets go and becomes an open window for the service of the Lord within. In tranquility is the supreme virtue, and through it shines radiant love. So this paragraph starts out with a really important point that Yoranda's making that ties all of this together, and it's trust. For he who puts his full and complete trust in his Father within remaining centered in him, knowing him as the one source. And this is challenging because we have grown up in this world, this human created world, where we have learned to put our trust in the outer things, into money and positions and others, so that our experience is fully dependent upon what happens to us and outside of us from the world. And to completely replace all of that trust that we've invested into the world and invested into this invisible source, that takes a lot. That takes a lot of trust. And yet the reward for such display of surrender and faith, the reward for that is union with the divine source within and being able to receive the gift of service as that eternal, infinite, all-knowing presence directs our lives in a way that the outer mind never could. With that level of trust, there is the tranquility, that stillness and peace. Because we're connected to the God source within ourselves, that aspect of universal being, that which is called I am that I am, can speak forth the words, peace, be still because we can only call forth peace from the world around us if we are centered within peace ourselves. And we can only know that type of peace if we are centered within the source of peace. From that space, something mystical and magical can happen. 
And Yoranda uses a little bit of poetry in this paragraph to describe the experience of what flows from the wonderful one within inside of that space of tranquility. And he says that it calms the waves that distort the vision. And I believe that these waves are our perceptions, our beliefs, our assumptions and presumptions about other people, the world itself, how things are, the way things work. They distort our vision to what's actually possible because we end up seeing through these filters of perceptions that we've bought into and believe. And those waves can be calmed by the peace of tranquility and can remove the mountains that prevent release. And I believe that these mountains are very similar to the waves because they're perceptions, but they're concreted beliefs that we have, paradigms that prevent the release of a divine dispensation for the glory and wonder of the wonderful one to move through our capacities. I used to believe that it took a lot of hard work in this world to get anywhere, to make anything happen. And I believe that it was taught to me, it was demonstrated to me by family and culture and the world around. And I've learned to challenge that. And I know for myself that it is like an experience of a mountain being moved, which opens the way for something new to be known. And this last part of the sentence, Pouring the soothing oil of love upon the feverish brow of the weary one that turns wholeheartedly to the Lord. For in some way we are all weary ones. We all know the experience of struggling, fighting, attempting to use the outer mind willpower. Every one of us who's been embodied in a human form in this world for any period of time knows what it is to struggle. And over time, it makes us feel weary, perhaps even a little broken and beaten down by the world around us. And that experience will continue until we turn fully and wholeheartedly to the center of peace, the center of source within ourselves. And we let go of the fight. We let go of the battle. We let go of the need to try to control, to predict, and to make something the way that we think it should be. The outer mind lets go, finally, and becomes an open window for the service of the Lord within. And this is such a beautiful picture. If you can imagine a veil within consciousness and opening a window, just like in the last paragraph, he said, becomes a doorkeeper for his Lord. Just providing this space of connection where divine reality can flow through me, through my capacities, enlightening my mind, invigorating my body, guiding my actions, shaping my words, letting the power of love infuse into every way that I express on this earth. That's beautiful. And that is the service of the Lord within, which is of course of great service to our world. In fact, I personally believe it's the only thing that is ever going to truly cause our human race to wake up and to ascend into a higher level of function. It won't be the next big idea. It won't be the next energy solution. It won't be the next peace treaty. It won't be the next big money maker, whatever that is. The only thing that can get us out of this space of relating to the outer world as our source of cause and trying to manipulate outer circumstances and events to our liking. The only thing that can change eons, generations and upon generations of operation built out of fear and separation. Entire world cultural societies and systems that have been built out of fear and separation. I don't, I don't know that we as humans can fix that, but the power that created all of creation has the power to make all things new. And that power can come into this world, into our human world, only as the human opens up to that power, becomes an open window, and enters into the service of the Lord within, and in turn is then serving the divine presence within all the world. This has been such a joy to explore some of these concepts and these very enlightened and mystical teachings by this being that went by the name Yoranda. 
I'm honored to be able to do this together with you. If you've enjoyed this, please leave a comment. I would love to hear your thoughts. Just comment below. We know what we express, and we are the ones bringing forth a new reality. Hit the like button, and if this episode has value for you, then share. Share so that more people can also find this material and receive that value. May you attune to the highest, maintain a vibration of love, and uplift your world by blessing all. Join us next week as we explore Chapter 3, Realization. It's gonna be amazing. Until the next time.